but no, the name they settle on is actually Cessationism Conference. Not even the Not Cessationism, cessationism conference. conference. It's like whoever named it was so tired yeah. and lacking so much iron in his blood. It's so true. The energy to pronounce the definite article. No, no, no. This, this is the point. Is that the Holy Spirit is absolutely vivifying people. He's mortifying the flesh. He's sanctifying believers. All right. He's he's regenerating, taking out the heart of stone and giving the heart of flesh. He's reminding people of the words of Christ. He's pointing us to the Bible. He's pointing us to Jesus. Yeah. He illuminates his word for us. Yeah. A way for him to make his enemies sound like something they're not, and that's why we have to make videos in response. So right. for people to go, why are you guys always going to yeah. be fighting and I, back and yeah, forth? Yeah, I'm so tired of people fighting. It's like, okay. Tell him that. Right. He's not telling the truth about his opponents. And He's... that's the problem. Just to be fair to cessationists, because I don't want to misrepresent... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Why is he making this video? Daniel Kalenda just put up a video full of miracles. That's you wouldn't it. have to that's jump right. through all these intellectual hoops. You wouldn't... Hello and welcome to... Hit the Bar! I'm Steve Kozar. Paulette Kozar. And I'm David Lovey. Who's not Kozar. It was not Kozar, but we got the two dogs. I was about dogs. to say, David Kozar. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yes, yeah, so... You know, um... I just realized you have to have a long O in your last name in order to be part of the show. That's oh, yeah. right. Yeah, that's it. But Kiko. You know, yeah. Kiko. Kiko. Ginger. Jinjo. Jinjo. <laughs> no, anyway. They're, their last name is Koza. Yeah, that's it. That's they're, all they're, that matters, right? They're allowed. Okay, right. so what are we going to talk about today, boys and girls? Oh, boy. Daniel Kalenda. <laughs> Daniel Kalenda. Let's just get a little flavor for where he uh, sits on. Uh, I know many continuationists that. What I love about Kenneth Copeland Ministries and the relationship between Christ for All Nations and KCM is that this goes back a long way and the history books are going to record a very close uh, working relationship between these two ministries. Since I've taken over for the last 12 years. So he, he has a close relationship to Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland, Copeland as the leader of and his... And he's going to go down in history. You go down in history. Going to go down in history. Yeah, I'm... You go down in history. I've watched important. the consistency, I've watched the faithfulness, and my heart has just been stirred as I've seen the heart that Kenneth Copeland Ministries, Kenneth and Gloria have, uh, not just for the church world, but for the nations and for the lost. For me personally, it's been incredible encouragement, and I, I have found that this relationship is a match made in heaven. Okay, I'm just going to come out and say it. Cessationism is heretical. Okay, that's the topic tonight. So the, the guy who's in cahoots with Kenneth Copeland yeah. is going to teach us about what it means to have a heretical theological position, and that would be the position of the movie maker in the room. We didn't make a movie. No. He did it. No, right. right. Yeah. We, really? watched, we watched the movie. It was it was a really good movie. We're the heretical ones, not Kenneth Copeland and this no, guy. That's no. right. Yeah, right. That's so right. He, he just came out with this video. Four days ago. Is that what it was? Uh, well, that's what... Uh, Don. Oh, no, no. So yeah, this was about two weeks ago okay. now. And this is actually um, part one of a two-part. Maybe he's going to have a third part. I, di I didn't get that far. But he's going to make a case for why to be a cessationist is an embarrassment. It's ridiculous. It's foolish. And I want us to keep... Oh, And uh, it's heretical. It is mm -hmm. heretical. So I thought it would be important to it's know actually what the word really means. It means that you're just slightly off on a thing. But other than that, you're a wonderful man of God. Yeah. Okay. Isn't it? Uh, actually, no. To 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 teach and believe in a heretical belief, or a, to have a heretical belief, to believe in heresy puts you outside of the Christian faith. It means that you believe something like Jesus isn't God, right? Or Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It is to believe a doctrine which undermines the gospel. That's that's what heresy really comes down to. Against the uh, the orthodox teaching of the Christian church. And this is a difficult, to, to really go into detail about how do you define heresy, you know, the, the Roman Catholics would have a slightly different way of describing it compared to a Protestant or compared to somebody who's in the orthodox church, which is not to be confused with the general meaning of the word orthodox. Mm. But we're Protestants, so we would say it really goes against the Bible. To, to have a heretical belief would to believe something that's it's not only um, something maybe outside of Scripture, but it actually is contrary to the gospel message of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So being someone who holds to a heretical belief means you believe something that's going to keep you outside the bounds of 
gospel-centered, Christ-centered, uh, Christian and biblical belief. Yep. Does that sound like a pretty good summary? Yes. Uh, you, it's I, it's kind of hard to imagine somebody being uh, a heretic who also is a Christian. Yes. But he's going to make that case. Right. That that even the early church councils were called together to combat actual heresy. I mean, that's why um, the Council of Nicaea met, was because Arius was a heretic who was undermining the gospel by saying that Jesus was a created being. That's one example of a historical heretic who Orthodox Christians, and when I say Orthodox Christians, I don't mean uh, people in like Eastern Orthodoxy. I mean the accepted Christian, his, historically accepted Christian doctrine um, that Orthodox Christians would condemn someone like uh, Arius because his teaching undermined the authority of the scripture. It undermined the divinity of Christ. Right. Um, and so, so when this guy makes this charge that cessationists are heretics, he not only doesn't even know what he's talking about, and, I mean, if, if we are, then that guy's the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> that's for sure. Well, let's hear okay. what he says next. Let me say it again for the kids in the back, in case you didn't hear me. Ladies, that's what I want to do. I want to keep, I want to keep track of. Uh, we How need many to times he's sarcastic? Well, I want to have like a in insultometer. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> insultometer. Yeah, yeah, so, for the kids in the back, is is that an insult or is he just trying to be clever? I'm not sure if that's a pure insult yet. Let's give him another eight or ten seconds before we get yeah. to an, an actual Are you insult. Sure? Maybe just yeah. two seconds. Ladies <laughs> <laughs> and gentlemen, boys and girls, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues. Let me say it loud and clear. Cessationism is heresy. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't consider cessationists brothers and sisters in Christ. I know a lot of wonderful people that are Christians who are cessationists, and they are amazing, godly people. And on the other side, I know many continuationists that are not very godly people. So we're not talking here about the fruit of individual lives. I'm talking about the doctrine itself. Can, I, can you pause that? Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to just reach over. And I know. We don't have enough room. The fruit of individual Christian lives always flows from one's theology. Yes. It always does. What you most believe is how you are going to act. And so uh, him saying that we as cessationists are heretics, and yet we're, he's not talking about any kind of fruit of our lives at all, just we're heretics be because we believe that the miraculous apostolic gifts of the Spirit have ceased in when the apostolic period of the church came to its conclusion, then what he's necessarily saying is that we are outside of historic Christian orthodoxy, outside of the Christian church, the, the foundation doctrines of the Christian church. It's right. really so, twisted. Yeah, the, twisted. The, 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 word. the only way... If, if you go to the history of the use of the word, it was the Catholic Church, when the Catholic Church was the church. Mm. So there will, there will be people who hear the word heresy, and they'll, they'll associate it with the Catholic Church. And we don't mean the church as we know the Catholic Church today, but the actual word Catholic only means universal. Yeah. So for the first thousand years of the church, it was the universal church. There weren't all these different denominations. Yeah. So... That the Catholic Church or the Universal Church or the Original Church, they defined heresy as that which went against the teachings of the Church. And the teachings of the Church were the teachings that everybody, even, I would even make the point that uh, today what we might call a Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or any of the Protestant churches, there's a lot that we still all hold in common. Mm -hmm. The Trinity, for example. This is a, this is a super important doctrine. You know, um, so... He's really muddying the waters here by, in the, at the very beginning, I mean, he's, he's like 20 seconds in, and he's already contradicting himself, and he's filled people's minds with confusion. And at the same time, this is what I really want to point out. I'm not just going to point out what he's doing wrong. What I want you to see are patterns that everyone keeps using, and these patterns um, 
they're manipulative. They're uh, fundamentally, this is about manipulating your audience to continue to hold on to your audience. This is not about having an actual dialogue using words that have definite meanings. This is not about actually finding out what your opponent literally is teaching and believing. Mm -hmm. It's making a straw man of your opponent so then you can... So when he says, they're my brothers and sisters, that sounds good. And this puts people off from being... Uh, skeptical. Skeptical or reactionary or right. thinking, oh boy, he sure is on his high horse. Well, what you're going to see is he's as high as he could possibly be on his horse. <laughs> and the horse is as tall as it can <laughs> <Yeah>. get. <laughs> but at the same time, he wants to sound like he's the nice person. Yeah. Yep. But what I want you to really notice here is, would you say this about people you considered your brothers and sisters that you respect and love? Or does this sound like somebody who's got a real chip on his shoulder? Heaven is going to be full of cessationists. Okay. Well, former cessationists, anyway. Thank God having perfect theology is not a requirement for salvation. Wait, wait, pause but it. I stand by... Wait, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I just realized this. <laughs> he just said heaven is going to be full of former cessationists. But as we're going to see in this video, he interprets 1 Corinthians uh, 13 to mean that the entrance into heaven or the return of Christ is the fulfillment and the ceasing of the gifts of prophecy and tongues. So actually, when we're in heaven, we'll we will be former cessationists. Yeah. Or I mean, for, former... What, wait, wait. How you I will be that? a cessationist. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Edit that part out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, what I just said. When we're in heaven, we will... According to this guy, we will be cessationists. Why? Because what he's saying is... That in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is saying at the return of Christ, these gifts will cease. So we will be cessationists. This is then. going to be a long video. Yeah. yeah cause I, we're, I, uh, I know. Because yeah. we have to like pause it every second. I, yeah. Uh, I know. Yeah. By my statement, that cessationism itself is a doctrine of demons. Hmm. It's Wow. So, so you could be... What's this guy schooling? I'm serious. I oh, don't... he studied under Dr. Michael Brown. Oh, that's right. So what kind of a level... Uh, junior Cub Scout level? <laughs> yeah. no, he Cracker went, Jack box <laughs> level? He, Does he got the ring? Does he have the signet he, ring? He went to the Dr. Michael Brown fire school of that, So he didn't that, go yeah. to seminary. Uh, he didn't study. You know what? Let's look that up. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I'm thinking oh. the way he's talking and how he's phrasing it really makes him sound very ignorant. And I thought he wasn't, you know, I thought he had to have some kind of, uh, you know, impressive resume on like, at least knowing words, <laughs> what they mean. <laughs> so right, just throwing away, throwing around words yes. like heresy. And yeah, so on. yeah, and and, mm -hmm. and um, you know that it's that heretical they, believers can also be brothers and sisters in Christ, and and yeah. you know our fruit isn't about our doctrine. Yes, it is. Yeah. What well, we we will act on what we believe. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's like human nature, though. Too, you know, whatever your convictions are, you are going to be that person. Yeah. Yep. He uh, is obfuscating the severe. I mean, even just while Steve's looking that up. Yeah. He's obfuscating the severity of the word heretic. Yes. Right. He's he's making it seem less severe than what it actually is. Yeah. And and like you said, it's a tactic. You can then you can then say really anything about anyone. Yes. And say, hey, but they're brothers in Christ, yes. though. So, kind hey, like, I, I love them. Oh, God bless yeah. you. Bless his heart. He's such an that's idiot. It. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's that's kind of, seems to be, but he's saying it in a different way. He's, oh, that's right. I did look this up. It was a long okay. time ago. He's a graduate of Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, and the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry in Pensacola. Yeah. <laughs> so that uh, Southeastern is a real school. Yeah, but Brownsville like a, Revival, where Dr. Brown was shouting at everyone, fire! That's right. Fire! That's right. Fire! Yeah, fire game. Like shouting, Lord, send fire on us, like how you did in Sodom. No, right. he didn't say that, no. that second part. No. <laughs> send down fire. Call down fire from heaven upon us. That's actually a really bad yeah. thing to yeah. ask Want. God for. That's... Like, As I know judgment. I know what he's saying. Right. What he he's thinks trying, he's saying. Yeah, what he thinks he's saying is the fire of Pentecost with the right. tongues mm -hmm. of fire, right. which was a one time event which has never been repeated in the history of the entire church, what happened in Acts chapter two. That is a one time event. So even to yeah. even to try to call that down from heaven as if Michael Brown had the 
authority to do such things. Okay, okay. Even the even the disciples themselves were not the ones who called down the tongues of fire upon themselves. The Holy Spirit is the one who came like a rushing wind in, and he did that to them. They didn't have the power to to call down the Holy Spirit's anointing. What does Jesus say about how the Holy Spirit works? This, just as the wind blows where it will, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So it's the Spirit's sovereign will when he's going to come and do whatever he wants to do. David, David, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just way, way off base here because <laughs> Empowered right. 21, uh. they're going to have it. They're going to bring back the uh, Pentecost. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah, so you should probably join this group and quit talking it? about the when Bible. Is it? Let's put it in our, it's going to be in 2033? Yes. No. 2033? Yeah. So they got years they now. only got 10 years to go. I started, They're planning the car. I wonder if it's $300 that kind of <laughs> <laughs> Their vision is that every person on earth would have an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit by Pentecost of the year 2033. Wow. All right. Well, you know, that's kind of... You know what that does? Kind of gives them a little bit of space and Wiggle leeway room. for them. Ten, ten years. Yeah, we said ten years. Yeah, that was last year. Well, no, no. I don't know no. if Greta Thunberg is right. We're not even <laughs> going to be on the planet then. How dare you? So, this this actually is a really big organization. I don't know. Really? So what are we? Is this is this Dr. Michael Brown's? No. Look at the, these are all the people who are working together to make sure that Pentecost comes back again in the year 2033. There's Heidi Baker. Uh, there's Andy Bird. Uh, there's Christine Kane. Uh, some of these names I don't know. I know they're from other countries. Jensen Franklin. Yeah, Jensen Franklin, the guy who doesn't know anything about the Bible. Yeah. But he keeps preaching anyway. There's Claudio Friedson, who had the huge... Uh, upturn in his revival after he got the impartation by reading Benny Hinn's book. I'll mm -hmm. be putting that in a recent video. Oh, here we go. Now we got some really serious apostles. We got Bill Johnson and Cindy Jacobs. You got Daniel Kalenda right there. They're going to bring the Antichrist, man. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was it. certainly thinking it. But I yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's... let's. Oh, uh, so you didn't say... Uh, this guy... This there's, there's Robert Morris, who has no connection to the New Apostolic Reformation, according to Dr. Michael Brown. Because it's a, it's not even real. It's not even right. real. There's Nathan Morris, another one of the Kalenda's friends. So what are we looking for? Just more? Just to see how Kalenda's tied in. Though. Who's who? It is real, though, for real. Yeah, it is real. Wow. All, like, it's like a, it's like a who's who of actual heretics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think this is where we were. But I stand by my statement that cessationism itself is the doctrine of demons. Hmm. It's rank heresy. Okay. And there's not a single reasonable or rational, much less biblical justification for it. And I'm going to try to prove that today on Daniel Kalenda, Off the Record. Okay, this is what I said when I heard off the record. That usually means you're not supposed to be on the record. I know. <laughs> but right. he's on the record being off the record. Yeah. Just yeah. like we're heresies hey, and brothers in Christ. But he's going to tell us about how important it is to have a catchy name. Yeah. Oh. Remember when he talks about the cessationist conference? Yeah, yeah. He, oh, yeah. Well, like, we got to wait till yeah, that we comes. Wait. Hey, because yeah. here's the thing. Oh, man, I can't wait. Because I can't <laughs> wait till we even get there. Because he said, he says in here, but you'll see, he says in here like, I, I just imagine what it was like when these guys thought up this conference. Like, it's it sounds like in their dying breath, cessationist <laughs> conference. All right. But actually, I'm... I'm the one who thought of the cessationist Is conference. It really? I'm the one. It was my actual wait, idea. Wait. Is it have the word the? No, yeah. it doesn't. Oh. You know why? Because we're trying to be efficient with our words. <laughs> and not... Unlike the babbling that we're used to hearing from That's the right. <laughs> I was gonna say something funny, but no. Off it's fine. The record. Off the, even though he's on the record. Yeah. Don't anybody share this. Hello everyone, welcome back to Off the Record. <laughs> I'm Daniel Kalenda, and today we're talking about the heresy of cessationism. You heard me right. And if you're wondering why now, well, you may or may not be aware that there's been a pretty widely advertised conference about cessationism that's been getting a lot of attention <laughs> online recently. Yeah, cool. And when I first saw the advertisements for it, honestly, I thought it was a joke. I mean, it wasn't just a conference with cessationist speakers. That wouldn't be very unusual. This was... I thought it was a joke. I would consider that an insult. It's an insult. Yeah, totally. It's an insult. 
I only got one so far. Did I did I miss something? Well, I mean, the, the, her- the heretics part might be an <laughs> insult. I don't know. Well, that's just a. How about oh, just children, moms and dads, stand. esteemed fellow, whatever? I mean, no, he that's was... just stupid. That's just dumb and corny. It's not. It's not an insult. He's gonna get to the insult. Okay. okay. I want to. I want to make sure okay. we count. We're him. only two minutes in. I think that this. I think oh, we should record for like four hours. This time. <laughs> it was actually called cessationist conference. Uh, oh, here we go. Yes, you heard that right. This was actually an idea that made it past some individual's prefrontal cortex it's mine. and out into the real world. <laughs> How did it I'm happen? To imagine the brainstorming meeting where this was pitched. Huh. It's like, hey guys, I've got this idea. Okay, hear me out. Let's get together, charge $300 a piece. Hey, Daniel. This is exactly how it happened. Hey, Daniel Kalinda, <laughs> would, you, um, would you like me to look at your um, impartation breakfast fees and compare that to the amount of money that people are spending Wait, to go to this conference? Wait, he's got an impart... What Impartation is breakfast? Well, wow. is it when you eat the eggs? Does, does, you... Do you get more than just coffee? It's in the video that we did last time. Yeah. And per hour, he's charging more than the cessationist conference. More than $300 an, an hour, hour to go to the No, it's not $300 an hour. It's $300 for three days. It's $100 oh, a day. That's right. I I so that. he's charging $50 to $55 for a two hour uh, chance to actually be in the same room with yeah, him, which right. has got to be amazing. I must did, did it's, it's called impartation, as though he has the ability to. Oh, he does. Impart. Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, which yeah. is why he gets the big bucks. That's Man. why he gets the big bucks. If you've never seen this video that we're showing, I mean, I know we're taking it like two second clips at a time, but <laughs> but if you've never seen it, like I'm kind of excited to get to some of the parts where he says the Let's craziest stuff of all. No, no, no. I mean, I want to see what his impartation breakfast oh, okay. is. Because that's, as long as it comes with bacon, I am there. <laughs> Pork. Yeah. <laughs> while, while you're looking that up, so this guy is the successor to Reinhard Bonnke. Yes. Yep. Who, as you Here remember. Impartation breakfast coming to a city near you. Oh, so it's kind of like he's going on tour. He's going on tour. From breakfast, cafeteria, cafeteria, <laughs> breakfast, New to cafeteria. Jersey, Charlotte, Denver, Miami, Nashville, Miami, Oklahoma, Chicago. Tampa. No. So let's let's see if we wanted to go to the one in New York or I don't New Jersey. Want to really go to it though. Date, Date changed. changed. They didn't see that coming. So <laughs> so it's two hours. Yeah. And it costs fifty to fifty five dollars. So let's say the breakfast cost twenty bucks. That's probably so the breakfast isn't included. No, it's it does include breakfast. Okay. So let's just subtract twenty dollars. So it's it's let's say it's, 30 um, it's 30. about thirty thirty five dollars for a two hour meeting. That's roughly about seventeen eighteen dollars an hour. Yeah. So if you went to a conference that was morning, afternoon, and evening, yeah. like a full day conference, and you I'm not good at math, man. Steve's good at figuring out. here, do you want your phone Somebody to in out the, the comment calculator? Section. Tell us how much seventeen times however many he <laughs> yeah. says. He'll figure so it out. So do you know the hours for the conference? Or like for let's just use the, the previous G okay. conference. No, no, you were just I, there. I know the con- the cessationist conference that made it past my frontal cortex. Yeah. <laughs> that it's it's gonna be like a Thursday night session okay and then it'll be all day all friday, day friday all day and saturday. then saturday from like morning until i think noon or three or something like that it's something like that so one two three. see you know what happens is like the more talented a person is in one area then the less talented they become in other areas i'm i'm really talented at nunchucks for instance. nunchuck skills <laughs> no and i'm trying to figure out what is and the amount number of hours for the actual conference i'm really talented at nunchucks for instance nunchuck skills and that means i'm not talented at math there right? you go like all the power went to my like nunchuck skills <laughs> girls only want boyfriends who have great skills None of the power went to my math, Your math. centers. All okay. of that is missing out of my brain. Got so, it. so based on what you just said, I came up with roughly a 16-hour total package between Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah. I took $300. I divided it by 16 hours. It's $18. And so it's the same exact price. Give okay. or take a, a 50 yeah. cents or a dollar. It's He's charging the same amount for his impartation breakfast with just him. Yeah, and you got a whole panel of people speaking. Yeah, but the prices per hour are the same. Yep, and he's going to do the same thing that Ruslan does. He says he's going to make fun of how expensive it is, and make a big, big deal about it, and he's going to say, "But I don't care that they're charging money." Well, then why are you making a big deal out of it? Because he knows he's charging the same amount for his events. Yeah, but then he says, it "Doesn't matter." So, this is very confusing, and I think it's just he likes the idea that he gets to insult people because he's off the record. And sit for a week talking about all of the things that God is not doing in the world. They sit for a week. 
Okay, the the was he saying the conference? It's lasts, not a week. Yeah, but am I am I understanding that correctly? He's saying that the conference is a week. He's just yeah. he's just you know trying spouting. to. He's just spouting. He's spouting off. Yeah. Nonsense. But you know what, Daniel Clinton, if it was a week and it was only 300 bucks, that would be actually there you yeah. go. an unusually all, low price. All, all about what the Holy Spirit, Spirit is isn't not doing, doing right. or what God is not doing. That's actually not true. Of course if, it's not if true. If you understand what the doctrine of cessationism really is, or even if you ever met a cessationist in your life, I've never met a cessationist who believed that God does not work in the world today. Uh, the, hey, the, without that straw man, he can't do his videos. That's so right. <laughs> God absolutely works in the world today. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. I take, uh, what, what, does, what does Justin Peter say? Um, uh, my, my doctrine of the Holy Spirit is, is not second to anyone else's. That, that the Holy Spirit is alive. He's at work in the world. I would affirm that the Holy Spirit is able to do miraculous things in the world today. Yeah. He's able to heal. He's able to uh, uh, do whatever he wants because he's yeah. God. Okay, So our position does not teach that the Holy Spirit uh, is dead or never works in the world or doesn't do anything. We absolutely 100% believe that the Holy Spirit is still doing even miraculous things today. The most yeah. miraculous being salvation. He's even going to talk about that as well. And to to again quote Justin Peters, he says that no, on, on the contrary, my view of the Holy Spirit is so important and so mm -hmm. highly esteemed that I will not attribute to the Holy Spirit things that he isn't doing. Mm -hmm. So when you have a low view of the Holy Spirit, you'll attribute anything and everything to him. Yeah. So when people are saying ridiculous false prophecies, when they're rolling around screaming, laughing, acting drunk, they say that's the Holy Spirit. And acting possessed. And acting like, like you have demons. Like they're in agony. Yep. Mm -hmm. Getting uh, electrocuted yep. and screaming in pain and feeling like Throwing you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's... That's something that we shouldn't be attributing to the Holy Spirit. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this is a way for him to make his enemies sound like something they're not. And that's why we have to make videos in response. So right. for people to go, why are you guys always going to yeah. keep fighting and I, back and yeah, forth? Yeah, I'm so tired of people fighting. It's like, okay. Tell him that. Right. He's not telling the truth about his opponents. And He's, that's the problem. How would you like it if somebody goes online, you know, lying about your daughter? You know, you're not going to just sit back and say, well, I'm not going to say something about it. Right. Oh, I don't know, Larry, that doesn't sound very interesting. Uh, do you at least have some really exciting branding that we could use to sell this terrible Sarcasm. idea to an unsuspect? Sarcasm. So, I, do one. I find it interesting <laughs> that he, he, he's doing this thing about branding. Yeah. This is one of the one of the great ironies, I believe, yeah. of the charismatic world that's supposed to be all about the Holy Spirit. Mm. They really place a high emphasis on marketing and branding yep. and uh, production quality. It's the only way that this guy has two hundred and twenty seven thousand followers. <laughs> yes. on Amazing his YouTube page. Amazing. Um, how about the oh, that... Divine in Action Expo? That's another sarcastic. Or, or maybe okay, put down. the Divine in Action Talking about Expo. all of the things. No, no, no. This this is the point is that the Holy Spirit is absolutely vivifying people. He's mortifying the flesh. He's sanctifying believers, all right? He's he's regenerating, taking out the heart of stone yeah. and giving the heart of flesh. He's reminding people of the words of Christ. He's pointing us to the Bible. He's pointing us to Jesus. Yeah. He illuminates his word for us. Yeah. He, to say that we believe that he's inactive is it's just simply slanderous yes. it's not it's just not true he's lying about yes. those who hold the cessationist with position. a broad brush cuz yeah. everybody's in there but remember he loves us as right. that god is not doing in the world oh i don't know larry that doesn't sound very interesting who's larry uh, do you at least have some really exciting branding that we could use to sell this terrible idea to an unsuspecting public that's an insult um how about <laughs> the divine inaction expo that's an insult or maybe we could call it Miracle Free Zone, celebrating <laughs> the Almighty's day off. Wow. Oh, that's so funny. It's terrible. He's it's so, so funny. Bad. Look at that face. I mean, is that... that <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we could call it Faith Without Frills. Or Miracle Con, since we think all miracles are a con. Oh, that's not uh, what we believe insulting. at all. Insulting. But that's you insulting. Know what, you know what? It's... He feels like he has the right 
to be insulting, to be a bully, mm-hmm. to have bully tactics, to be name calling and sassing at people whose work he doesn't even know because he's never looked at it and he's never read about it and he's never looked into it. Well, we don't that, know. We based, don't know. That's based, right. Based on what he's saying here, he's at the least pretending that it's something that he knows it's not or he hasn't taken the time to actually figure yeah. out what it is. In either case, guess, he's straw manning. I guess I crazy. feel like if somebody's actually logically looked at two different sides and has understood it, they would have more of an explanation or, ex, you know, explain it instead of doing this broad brushing insulting thing. Oh, yeah. And he's just getting started. But no, the name they settle on is actually cessationism conference. Not even the not cessationism, cessationism conference. It's like whoever named it was so tired. <laughs> yeah. And lacking so much iron in his blood. It's so true. Energy to pronounce the definite article. Yeah. It's like one of those movie scenes where somebody who's been shot or something is uttering their last dying words. That's why I named it that. Cessationism conference. (laughs) Is there really a market for this? Are there really people? Is that what you did? Yeah, that's true. See, he's you know what? He's a prophet prophet. and a seer. So, of course, he saw that. You know, when he says, is there really a market for this? Right. Is he actually asking that question? That's all he cares about. That's all he cares about is the market. No, what I think is what he's saying to this is This is really key. Okay. He doesn't care what we think. He doesn't no. care what cessationists think. What he cares about is one thing and one thing only, and that is retaining his audience. Yeah. So when he says that, he's saying to all the people who already just lap up whatever he says and just take it as truth, <laughs> is there actually people out there, you know, the people who aren't us, who actually believe these things and think this way? <laughs> of course, right. they're so much different than us and so much lower than us. Mm. He's really playing to his base. Yep. So if you're a follower of this guy, I'm sorry if I'm insulting you, but uh, you know what? Let's be honest. We were in Amway. Right. We know what it's like to be in a mind control yes, cult. Yes, we do. We were in it for four years. Where everything you do is not working. <clears throat> right. And you believe things that just are totally false. Mm. But you have to live in this bubble where everything keeps reinforcing that you're in the right group by constantly insulting all the people right. outside of the group. We were part of this, so we know what's going on here. That's why I recognize these sorts of tactics. So I know it seems like I'm just mad at him, but he's just one of many, and they all do sort of the same thing. He's just becoming a lot more obvious than he would have been, I think, in the past. Mm-hmm. People that are willing to pay $300 a ticket to go listen. I don't know. They pay $55 to go to your stupid impartation breakfast. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. I called it stupid. Maybe that was insulting. Yeah. Okay. Your, There's your side scary. and his side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, Love an impartation breakfast. Yes. You, you, you actually are promising to impart something to people when they go there. So he's in charge of the Holy Spirit. There he's, you go. He's got it all in the bag. Listen to people talk about what God is not doing. Just trying to think about how these sessions go. Hey, I'm Justin Peters. Today I'm going to talk about all the ways that God does not heal people. Insult. Insult. Or hi, I'm John MacArthur. Today my session is called Divine Indifference. Insult. How God is busy doing nothing. Insult. Insult. Wow. Hold on. Maybe there's a session. Is that what John MacArthur teaches? See, this God is where is busy doing nothing. If Daniel Kalinda did what we heresy hunters do, he would provide <laughs> actual right. clips of these people Footage. saying something Please. like this. But he never Absolutely. does that. I did a whole video on him just a year ago. And he did a whole series about the NAR, and he strawmanned every single position. He didn't use one clip to make one point about all the people who are wrong. And all the people who've written books. I mean, everything he said was his version of right. reality, and then you're supposed to just believe him. This is not what an actual, a person making an actual argument actually lets the other side demonstrate how wrong they are by showing them doing these things wrong. He's not going to do that. He's no. just strawmanning. And called... How to be broke, busted, and disgusted, all for the glory of God. There you go, another insult. Maybe that's why they're charging $300 a ticket, by the way. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's why you make over $300,000 a year, and then you still have uh, people supporting you on Patreon? Those deplorable charismatics and their prosperity. We are so much better than them in every way, are we not, brethren? Oh, yes, yes, we are. Mm. For your Maybe it's podcast? all part of the session about poverty and how you can attain it another one we'll help you get poor another one um daniel Kalinda, can you show evidence this. of these people that are actually saying that we expect all christians to live in poverty because this is the same stupid tactic that ruslan did okay but 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 in the last video that we did yes. hit the bar yeah. podcast 
I did say in that video, if you were paying attention and watching this one as well, <laughs> I did say, if you go to the conference, you will be more poor because you spent $300 <laughs> at it. So, I don't know, you know, he could probably, like, cut that and place it in there and, and say that, that that is what I Maybe said. Maybe financially, but not yeah. spiritually. Not spiritually. Yeah, yeah. Of, of, course. of course. Man, this is like, <clears throat> this is... An actual straw man that these people can, are continually mm -hmm. saying. Rusland said it. This guy is saying it. Isaiah Saldivar did it. Ha, is, I think. is saying that cessationists believe that you should be poor. But they should be rich. But, but they should be cessationist yes. leaders like John MacArthur are all getting rich mm -hmm. while they're telling everyone else to get poor, which right. isn't true, which isn't true, which isn't true. Right. And um, I'll, maybe I'll drop these in here, but the G3. Uh, organization, which is actually w kind of the umbrella for the conference. It's a G3 conference being held at John MacArthur's church, but it's actually a G3 event in conjunction with you guys, the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. The guys who run that organization don't get a salary. They have, uh, I looked at their 1040s, they, they make no money. So any of the money being raised is not being used for personal salaries. What do you think about that, Daniel Kalenda? Right. I don't know. He's not going to watch I'm this. not no. getting any money from the conference, by yep. the way. And, there you go. Uh, so yeah, uh, but 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 regardless, yeah. he's he's still making this point. The point that that he's saying is that cessationists are we preach that a person shouldn't have money. That's not any part of cessationist doctrine at all. What he's talking about is that typically cessationists will preach against the prosperity message, mm -hmm. which says. That if you give Daniel Kalenda money, then you're going to prosper and get money yourself from after giving him money. That I'm 100% against. But I don't know a single cessationist who is against having money. Having money is neither good nor bad. Mm -hmm. It's a, In a sense, it's a neutral thing. Mm -hmm. What Jesus says is that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Right. If a person, you can be a poor person and love yes. money, I've just like them. you could be a very rich person and love money, or you could be a rich person who is very generous yep. with your money, and you could be a poor person who relies on the Lord to give you your daily bread every day, as every rich person should do. That's the reason why Jesus says, how hard is it for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for a camel to, to go through the eye of a needle. Well, why? Because as a general principle, uh, you know, the rich feel like they don't need to rely on God because they're, they can rely on their money. That's why Jesus. That's why Jesus says that. So then the disciples say, "Who can be saved? What is impossible with man is possible with God." So we're not preaching that a person shouldn't have money. That's a total straw man. It's a total misrepresentation of the cessationist position. And nobody in the cessationist conference is going to say you should be poor or you you right. shouldn't. Uh, you should quit your job and live in a monastery. Like, nobody's saying that. He's arguing against a position that nobody has said. We should have a separate list of how many straw man argue. I mean, the whole thing is a straw man. Yeah. Well, so far, anyway. Yeah, by the time you and your family buy tickets to this conference, you won't be able to afford to eat an in and out burger. It's in Southern California, so I'm contextualizing. Oh, that's so funny. But at $300 a head, it sure sounds like the speakers are getting paid. So, just to clarify, they don't believe... Daniel Kalenda, do you get speaking fees? I don't understand why he's even making these points. Of right. course the speakers are getting paid. Yeah. That's what a conference does. Yeah, hello. Do you but, have Hello, McFly. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he's making the same mistake that Russ Land did. Same exact in, mistake. In confusing and in, in calling someone like John MacArthur, and I'm, I'm not like a John MacArthur apologist, I'm just saying, accusing him of being a hypocrite for having $15 million because he's against the prosperity gospel. Which, which you don't is, even know that he has $15 million. Sure, That's course, just something that's found not. online. And so, so, but that's a non sequitur. Because if, if MacArthur was a prosperity preacher, mm -hmm. okay, and... And or he, if he preached the prosperity gospel or against, what am I trying to say? If he was saying to everybody, "Send money to me, and God will make you rich." Yes, then he would be a hypocrite mm -hmm. for right. then preaching against that. Okay? Right. Mm -hmm. But he's not preaching against that. What he's saying is 
that the message of the prosperity gospel, so-called gospel, is not the gospel at all. It actually has nothing to do with one's personal wealth. What he's saying is that the gospel itself is a different gospel than those who preach a prosperity message. And so it's not hypocritical for a person who preaches against prosperity, the prosperity message, mm-hmm. to actually have money themselves. Right. That's the point. Yeah. And it's I'm going to bring it up again, and I'll probably bring it up again later on, but... His organization is propped up by Kenneth Copeland. What I love about Kenneth Copeland Ministries and the relationship between Christ for All Nations and KCM is that this goes back a long way and the history books are going to record a very close uh, working relationship between these two ministries. Right. He loves Kenneth Copeland. He's seen how over decades of time Kenneth and Gloria Copeland have proven themselves. I've watched the consistency. I've watched the faithfulness. And my heart has just been stirred as I've seen the heart that Kenneth Copeland Ministries, Kenneth and Gloria have, uh, not just for the church world, but for the nations and for the lost. For me personally, it's been an incredible encouragement, and I, I have found that this relationship is a match made in heaven. To be, you know, great supporters and godly, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I can't think of a more notorious prosperity preacher than Kenneth Copeland. Right. Who loves money. And God has had us center up on heavenly economics. That's right. And how it works. And it works by certain laws of prosperity. That's it. In his own words. I mean, he talks about money, come to me. And you can speak things into existence, including your own personal wealth. And that, Didn't Oral Roberts say to him, silver and gold have we plenty? Yes. Yes, and they all thought oh, it was funny. Yeah, because oh, they were different so than the original terrible. apostles. Yeah. They were rich. Yeah. Right. This is, this is the underling of Kenneth Copeland. There you go. In his own words. I'm not saying that because I found some hidden thing somewhere. He's promoting Kenneth okay. Copeland himself. Let's get on that God will prosper you. But they do have quite a bit of faith that Ticketmaster is going to prosper them. Hmm. <laughs> Honestly, I don't Another care what they charge for tickets. Another one. Ticketmaster doesn't prosper you. They just take a stupid fee out of I don't think Ticketmaster is selling tickets. Yeah, hello. Is. No, he's just trying to be clever. <laughs> right. It just seems kind of hypocritical coming no, from these doesn't. guys that no, it doesn't. constantly rail on prosperity preachers. We already talked about when this. obviously we they it. and those that can afford to attend their uppity theological conference at $300 Another. a pop uppity, yeah. uppity. seem to be doing quite well. While most of the world lives on a dollar a day... He wouldn't know what that means. I this mean, guy does not know what it means to live by a dollar a day. Right, but he goes to Africa and stays in hotels and flies yeah. in jets, and yeah. he comes back home to his mansion in Florida. Yeah. I don't know which uh, mansion. I can't keep track of his addresses. Maybe his uh, ex-wife has the mansion that <gasps> I saw ex-wife. previously. Well, anyway. Yeah, we'll talk about that some other time. Maybe. But this idea that he's in favor of the poor, he's the guy that's on the side of the poor... Hmm. It's just not. Well, he lives an opulent lifestyle. Yeah, he, he Hello. does. Yeah. I know. At least, uh, at least at the upper end of middle class yeah. at best. Yeah. I mean, three hundred some thousand dollars a year salary is not what you would consider to be one with the poor. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> These guys just dropped what amounts to nearly a year's salary to sit around and discuss. You know what? That's true if they were holding this conference in a third world country, but this is a conference in America, so that's not even a good point. In Southern California. It's it's a ridiculous point. Yeah. This is what you do when you're desperate to try to make your opponent look as bad as possible when you don't actually have good <gasps> arguments. Yes, she's she doesn't coughing. like it either. Okay, she's so coughing she, in agreement. That's right. Instead of like howling, <laughs> she'll be doing the coughing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there's deplorable charisma. I want to. <laughs> I want to. I want to get somebody who's a, an expert on uh, doing proper British dialects. To He's sitting point out. here next to you right now. I, I'm the expert That's on That's it. it. There you go. This is one of the most pathetic examples of trying to do a British accent. I mean, nearly a year's salary <laughs> to sit around and discuss you know, those deplorable charismatics and their prosperity. We are so much better than them in every way, are we not, brethren? Oh, yes, yes, we are. Not to mention remarkably austere. Why, I only indulge in beluga caviar thrice weekly. <laughs> I don't even know what kind of, I don't even know what that is. In other words, he's saying he has caviar, but he only has it three times a week because he's austere and he's, he, he's careful with his money. No, he's saying that he's saying that about me. Right. Yeah, right. because you're the one that's <laughs> yeah. you're the one that thought of the whole He's saying that about me. Yeah. Listen. <laughs> cessation. Cessation. So, it's so funny. Yeah. I mean, uh, so 
for those of you who you don't, don't know you me, don't live on caviar three for times the, a week. For the, just for those of you who don't know me personally, um, which is all of you probably. <laughs> um, uh, I I teach sixth and seventh grade Bible at the local Christian school, and I pastor a church of twenty five people. Um, yeah, but less. He's he's probably a millionaire. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> no, he's the not. director. No, he's not. Well, he's not. None, one of you guys of us, is probably a millionaire. I mean, but I don't care. I don't right. need to be that. And you know? you know what? If you were millionaires and still wanted to make the movie with the content that it has, it would be irrelevant. Absolutely. So right. this is what you do when you're trying to just make your enemy look as bad as possible by doing a really bad British accent. I mean... It, Only I, eat caviar three <laughs> times a week. Oh. Uh, so if you're a cessationist, <laughs> this should make you go, what is he talking about? Yeah. What does this yeah. have to do with anything? I should also bring up and the, the little clips that I put in the last video is that if you were going to the Association of Related Churches Conference, the ARC, they charge $200 for a two-day conference. Mm. Same exact price. Okay, but wait. So, but those are charismatic, so he doesn't talk about them as having a British accent and eating caviar. Yeah, but the, thi but the thing is, though, is that if you, if you look up the, the thumbnail of who the speakers are going to be, I don't think there's any British people on it <laughs> at all. There, so he's wrong? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think... I mean, is Sinclair Ferguson coming? I don't think so. You know what? We have a lot of viewers in the UK, and yes, I'd just like do. to know, you're probably all wealthy, right? Because as soon as you hear a British accent, yeah, that immediately right. means that you're wealthy. <laughs> right. Right, Daniel Kalenda? Right. I think we should just keep him frozen right there. I like the face he's yeah. making. Yeah. Mm. $300 a head <laughs> at a conference where prosperity is going to be the main target. How does he know that? Yeah. Prosperity is going to be the, the main, main target. target. This is another conflation that these people do between the rightful rejection by sound biblical Christians of the prosperity message and the embrace of cessationism by sound biblical Christians, okay, that they're conflating these two things and saying that, um, saying that preaching against prosperity, you see, he's doing it. He's saying that preaching against prosperity is what cessationism is about. Now, I will agree and say this, that Every cessationist should be against the prosperity gospel because it's no gospel at all. Absolutely. The seed planting version where it says plant a seed to Kenneth yeah. Copeland yeah. and he and God has to give you a 10 or 20 fold return or whatever new formula they, they came you up can, with last you can, week. You can count on that. Yeah. Every every cessationist, uh, I mean, every, every biblical Christian yes. should be against that pros prosperity message um, where... If you sow money, you are guaranteed, and that uh, guaranteed wealth, and not only that, but guaranteed health, and that uh, health and wealth and and uh, happiness are purchased by Christ in the atonement. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are against that, absolutely. But the conference itself is not focused on the prosperity message or being against the prosperity message, what it's focused on is the actual true work of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is doing today and what he did successfully in the time of the apostles. And that those gifts that the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles and those who were associated with apostolic ministry, that's an important thing to remember. We are not saying that only apostles could do miraculous things in the apostolic time. Those who were associated with the apostles could also do that as well. Speak in tongues, uh, have gifts of healing, and so on. As Paul, he's going to bring it up, Paul goes to Corinth and he imparts gifts to them and they become puffed up by that. Um, but the, the conference itself is not going to be focused on we're, this is a conference anti-prosperity. That's I'm sure people that'll, are going to talk about that. That'll be, um, you'll call that anti-prosperity conference. There'll be no word, the, in the beginning <laughs> because you're so low on iron deficiency. Yeah, right. and, yeah I need a steak. Man. <laughs> need a steak. We don't got steak. But when I saw how much attention this conference was getting, I just couldn't resist the urge to weigh in and address the cessationism controversy myself. And honestly, it feels like such a low-hanging fruit. Guys, listen, you don't need a PhD to know that cessationism is utter and complete nonsense. Hmm. It's hogwash. It's malarkey. 
Three. It's flap doodle, as I heard Four. one southerner say. I'm, I'm counting for you. And so, you know, it reminds me. What do you think? Should each word be considered an insult? Yes. I, would, I think yes. we should combine all of them as one insult just no, to be. I don't know. I don't want to overdo it. You're being generous. I don't care about what this guy says about me. It's me of what the former cessationist theologian and pastor Jack Deere wrote. He said, if you were to lock... Uh, by the way, I read Jack Deere's books. I remember. And it was one of the biggest things to ruin about a 15-year period of my life. And I'm mm. serious when I say that. Yep. I thought they were amazing when I read them. And it took me on a trajectory that it took about 15 years to correct. Mm. So, uh, Jack Deere... I, I'm I'm not really. I know he's not as bad as a Kenneth Copeland. How are you guys doing? They're fighting. Are you fighting? I think they're hungry. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! They're finally getting along. If you call this getting along. Yeah, well, that's yeah. about as good as it gets. So he's going to say, if you were to lock a brand new Christian in a room with the Bible and tell him to study what Scripture said, with what the Scriptures have to say about healing and miracles, he would never come out of the room a cessationist. <laughs> and okay, okay. well, I'm let me. Sorry. She's okay? snarling at him. <laughs> she's kind of nipping at him. She's, and he's like, yeah, come on, let's do this more. She's the old lady. <laughs> she is the old lady. Like, hey, I'm an old lady. Leave me alone. Hey, you know what I think I need to do? Go feed him. Yeah, I'm going to go feed him. Sorry. Don't hit the microphones on your I way won't. out. I didn't last time. Okay, good. Sorry, guys. But when you have when you have animals in the scene, we've got issues. Um, well, I just want to say one thing about that. Um, if you got the... Go ahead, keep talking. I want to check the camera. I'm alone. I can say whatever I want now. <laughs> no, I'm still in the room. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, everything looks great. If you got the special edition of the film that G3 uh, put out, it came with a, a booklet. Actually, I, I put the booklet together, just researched a bunch oh. of quotes from... Uh, I didn't know that. ...from church history. I, and, I, you uh, told me about that, but I thought it was just your own notes, but it's actually part of the... If you buy the physical DVD... It comes with it. Yeah, it comes with like a booklet. I just bought it on Amazon. I didn't know I was... Oh, really? Well, you can just send it to me. I, you know what? I, I know the even, guy. I, I don't have a copy of it. <laughs> I wrote well, it. You, you well, I, have, I have a copy of this uh, yeah. on my phone. I don't need the paper one. Okay, yeah, yeah. I thought okay. you wanted the paper one. Um, <laughs> I mean, That's you know. Funny. I mean, because because once the... What's the uh, electromagnetic pulse? Oh, that's, I'm going to lose everything? Yeah. We, we're when I look at all the books every... I got down here, you know, I'm, I'm going to be well stocked for a while. <laughs> Once that hits and knocks out the power grid <laughs> and we're knocked back into Amish times. That's when Bigfoot <laughs> comes out of the forest and makes everything clear. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I put together this these quotes from church history and and what this says this jack deer if you were to lock a brand new christian in a room with the bible and tell him to study what the scriptures have to say about healing and miracles he would never come out of the room a cessationist i want to read something this is from the muratorian fragment uh which is in ad 170 very early attestation of cessationism muratorian fragment says this Hermas wrote The Shepherd very recently. So there, there's a book called The Shepherd of Hermas. Okay? It's an early church historical document. So the Muratorian fragment says this. Hermas wrote The Shepherd very recently. In our times, in the city of Rome, while his brother Bishop Pius sat in the chair of the Church of Rome. Therefore, it ought to be read. But it cannot be read publicly in the church to the people. So he's saying the Shepherd of Hermas, which is a book that was written in the early church, should not be read publicly during a church service. Nor placed among the prophets, for their number is complete. Nor among the apostles, for it is after their time. So the Muratorian fragment says that the time of the apostles had ceased. This is in A.D. 170. The last apostle, John, died approximately A.D. 95. So this is not very long. This is 75 years mm -hmm. after the apostle John died. The author of the Muratorian fragment is saying that the times of the apostles are over. The times of the prophets are over. And... Um, uh, there's, I want to read one more quote to you. Um, uh, Origen, who Origen had a lot of bad theology, too. I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, base all of my theology upon Origen. But Origen, writing from between 185 and 253, says this, For no prophet bearing any resemblance to the ancient prophets has appeared. This is Origen 
in the second and third century. These are, I have a whole list, uh, Lactantius, Eusebius, Gregory of Nazanius, Chrysostom, Theodoret of Cyrus, Augustine of Hippo, Gregory the Great, the Venerable Bede, Thomas Aquinas even, in some sense, believed that um, the apostolic age was complete, and then Luther and Calvin and Perkins and the Belgic Confession and John Owen and Thomas Watson and the Westminster Confession of Faith and Matthew Henry, Conyers Middleton, London Baptist Confession, Jonathan Edwards, John Gill, George Whitfield, Thomas Scott, William G.T. Shedd, Charles Hodge, Benjamin Warfield, Herman Bavinck, Louis Burkhoff, J. Gresham Machen, R.B. Kuyper, John Murray, Martin Lloyd-Jones, by the way. All right, let me just read this last one for you. Sorry. Go for I, it. I know, Go for it. I know. You're, you're, this is your platform. It's not mine. It's well, I mean, we're, we're, we're lending it to you, I Thank should you. say. Yeah. Thank you. Martin Lloyd-Jones, because he's like the charismatic's favorite, and I'm mad about that because hmm. he's not a charismatic, at the very least, of the kind that we see today. Uh, he had various different views on the working of the Holy Spirit today. He's somewhere in between. Hmm. Sometimes he comes across as a cessationist. I mean, John MacArthur calls Martin Lloyd-Jones the greatest preacher of the 21st century. I wholeheartedly agree in my personal, personal opinion. Well, you made a whole movie about him. I did. It's called Logic on Fire, The Life and Legacy of Martin Lloyd-Jones. And I still have to watch that. It sounds really interesting. I'm sorry I haven't seen it yet. But yeah, I, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. It's uh, on AGTV. Yes, it is. Yeah, so if you're a part yes. of AGTV, check that out. <clears throat> and um, and so this is what Lloyd-Jones says. This is in his book, Christian Unity, published by Baker Books that used to, used to be good. Baker did. <laughs> oh, all the Christian publishers are like that. Not anymore, man. I, I mean, they, they started out good in many cases, and there's still good books being published occasionally by some of them. But for the most part, you just don't know what you're getting anymore. In Grand Rapids, <clears throat> Michigan... Um, that's like the Christian book world headquarters. Yeah, you know, people call it the Mecca, but that's like it's a bad word because Mecca is it's, it's Muslim. Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the Mecca of Christianity is like an oxymoron. Any, anyway, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said this, A prophet was a person to whom truth was imparted by the Holy Spirit, a revelation or message or some insight into truth came to them, and filled with the Spirit, they were able to make utterances which were for the benefit and profit of the church. Surely it is clear that this again was temporary, and for this good reason, that in those early days of the church, there were no New Testament scriptures. The truth had not yet been expounded in written words." That's Martin Lloyd-Jones. So anybody who wants to say, oh, Lloyd-Jones is a charismatic, uh, not in that sense. Yeah, He's yeah. not. He did not believe in ongoing revelation. Well, what's interesting is that the the attitude that you're seeing from Daniel Kalenda here is it's either out of a, a real, and I don't mean this as an insult, but just ignorance. I mean, a lot of charismatics, they don't have the full picture as far as, um, you know, really understanding the historical nature of the church, and they haven't read a lot of the the most important writers. So they think that their version of charismatic Christianity is the only version. Yeah. And so it's a revision of history. It's a total revision, but he's going to make it sound like, you know, of course there's no such thing as cessationism or it's a tiny little, you know, uh, dying fragment of the church. That's really irrelevant. But the truth is it's the majority position for the majority of, of church history. I mean, we're not saying that there was never anybody who opposed some of those ideas. The Catholic miracles in the Middle Ages, and there's the Zwickau prophets. And and we were looking at the timeline in the movie last night, mm. and I was saying to Paul, I kept pressing the pause button, because I was supposed to help you with that, and I didn't. Oh. And I'm kind of glad I didn't. Would have been much better if he had. Well, there's just so many layers to it. Mm. Like before Wesley, because I agree, when you put Wesley in there, mm. but before Wesley, in the late 1600s, there was that uh, yeah. segment of the French prophets, the Huguenots, yeah. who had some really mystical stuff. And you actually hear Bill Johnson referring to those people today. I'm as, not surprised. Yeah, it's, so there's been little strains of these charismatic, mystic, mystical sorts of ideas popping up here and there. But what charismatics really are, are restorationists, yes. which is another point for probably another day. Should yeah. I just keep this going? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's keep going. Like a brand new Christian in a room with a Bible and tell him to study what the scriptures have to say about healing and miracles, he would never come out of the room a cessationist. And that's true. No one ever became a cessationist by Wait studying the Bible. 
that's exactly how I became a cessationist, hmm. was by studying the Bible. And I don't remember if I mentioned this before, but the reason that I made the movie Cessationist uh, really was because when I first became a pastor, was it was it you that actually started the idea, or I thought it was it Tim or what? The, the idea of cessationism. Yeah, yeah I invented cessationism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, look, there, there is a sense in which in which cessationism is is a reaction to this aberrant idea that primarily has dominated the 20th and now 21st centuries of the church, um, that the, the spiritual gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues and healing and prophecy... Fortune-telling. Absolutely. <laughs> are, are, like, proliferated and, and have always been here. And so cessationism says, wait, wait, no, they haven't, okay? Mm -hmm. No, they actually haven't. And it's very easy to prove that those things haven't because we don't see them happening in the world. Yeah, that's the that's the problem that's he's never going to bring up. Yes. In fact, even that quote from Jack Deere, I would take it a step further and say, if it's true that nobody would ever become a cessationist by reading the Bible, because if you read the Bible, you would simply come out of the room as a continuationist, then I would say, well, great, then everybody who simply reads the Bible and decides to become a continuationist should do the things that all these people claim are being done, mm -hmm. but they don't. But uh, but I became a cessationist because uh, when I first became a pastor uh, of of the first church that where I was a senior pastor at, um, up in Antioch, Illinois. Uh, well, you know, I, I don't know. Can can I very briefly maybe tell that story of that? Su super sure. super brief. Um, um, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian house, and I became a Christian when I was twenty two years old through. A missionary who invited me to Bible study and was very faithful to me and loved me. It's a great story. I, he told us that last time he was here. And it really is one of these things that makes it so insulting when a guy like this says, we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. We don't believe yeah. that God works anymore yeah. in the world when all that's, of our lives have stories of God working. It's just yeah. not making us roll on the ground and scream and holler and act drunk and speak in gibberish. You, you know why <laughs> You know why I titled uh, the book that, that I wrote? Whoa, what was that? The house is crashing. Was that Kiko doing something? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Andrew got up. Oh, it's it's a human being. It's not yes. a monster. It's not Wait, a bigfoot. Yes. There's a human being in the yes. house. Let me see what's going on. <laughs> Who is that? I'm sorry. We keep interrupting. No, 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 no. no. That's that's okay. Um, I don't I don't even remember what I was saying. We were just now. talking about um, your your pastor and how you were reading the yeah, Bible. Yeah. So 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 when I so. When when the Lord saved me at 22, and, I, right. and then or soon after I felt a calling to to some kind of ministry, uh, I joined as a volunteer at first with Jews for Jesus on the street and doing street evangelism, um, and I did that for years, and then and then I felt a calling as a pastor. I became a pastor in 2014, um, but even very early on in my Christian life, uh, because I had like listened to Tupac and. Notorious B.I.G. and Bone Thugs and Harmony, and that was like my music and, and classic rock uh, too, and like Led Zeppelin. I really, I really liked a large variety of music. After I became a Christian, my my little brother, uh, he gave me this CD that said "Wow" on it, W O W, and he's like, "Well, you're a Christian now, so I guess this is the kind of music you should listen to." <laughs> and I put it in my my CD player, man, and I was like. This is the worst music I've ever heard in my whole in my whole entire life. It's so so terrible. Okay, so okay. corny. You probably don't want to go down that road. And <laughs> Should I not? Yeah. All right. Look, I'm just saying. This is just my own. That opinion. That was your personal opinion. Yeah. You might you might love wow. whoever Stephen Curtis, whoever, or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what the I names did are. growing up. Great. Come on, that's, come on. That's Stephen wonderful. Curtis W. Smith. Chapman. Yeah. So so I'm not I'm not saying anything about them. Doesn't I don't, matter. I don't know them. I just it wasn't my preference. Thing. So yeah. I never listened to Christian music. My is my point. And when I first became a, a pastor, then and they were like playing these songs, like kind of some corny songs. I just thought, well, that's what Christian music is. It's just corny music. And a lady came up to me in the church right. service because I I had belonged to a church that only played hymns that's all I knew and a lady came up to me in the church service and she was like are are you going to allow this music to be played here in the ch 
in this the church. is the church after the hymn church. Yeah, yeah so afterward, when I became a pastor. They were starting to introduce new contemporary Christian worship yeah. music. Yeah, that's right. And and then they, they did that right before I got there. And and they were playing like Hillsong and Bethel music and, and Jesus culture and stuff. And uh and this was, it was my second week <laughs> as a pastor there. And this lady came up to me and she said, Are you are you going to allow this in the church? And I was like I don't know allow what like this these corny lyrics like this I don't know I, I don't know if I could fight against it or if I should or you know I, I got to pick my battles I, I felt like at the time and she's like no 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 you don't know like who who these people are attached to mm-hmm. what churches they come from no I don't have any idea who who Hillsong is or any of them and she came and brought me this packet of paper that she had printed off of the internet and collected articles. Probably some of them were you or your <laughs> articles. I'm not even kidding. Or, like, or it was the articles that I was also reading at that yeah, time. Yeah, for real. And and I had never, I went to seminary, I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I had, I had one semester of pneumatology in my systematic theology course. And like, that was it. I considered myself open but cautious. And as I was reading... The material that she's telling me about Bill yeah. Johnson and all of that stuff, my eyes were opened. Her, the lady's name is Jan Sheridan, and I, I really owe a lot to her. That's Th- awesome. This whole, this whole film came really out of her efforts to help me, as a pastor, open my eyes to see mm. how bad that, that stuff really is and its false teaching. And it made me ask the question, what really do I believe? Mm-hmm. about the working of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Yeah. Like, do I be- Am I really open but cautious? Am I a cessationist? Am I a charismatic? You know, hmm. and that caused me to go to the Bible and read what the Bible says. And through Bible study, contrary to what Daniel Kalenda says, I was not reading cessationist books. What, I, what she gave me was just articles on the NAR and all the terrible stuff that had ripped her family apart. Hmm. And, and, um, and as, as I was reading the Bible, that's what convinced me of the position of cessationism. So he's actually wrong about that. I just had never been serious enough about my own pneumatology to look into the matter and come to an actual formed opinion about it. What really do I believe about who the Holy Spirit is and how he works? And it was through the scripture hmm. that can conv- that's what convinced me uh, to not only make the movie, but to become a cessationist. So when uh, some people make the claim that cessationism is just a reaction, it's you're not a, you're just against something, you're not in favor of anything. I think that is true in certain ways about other topics. You know, uh, sometimes people say they're uh, conservative because they're so opposed to, let's say, the welfare state. Mm. And you ask them, what do you think about politically? All they talk about is the thing they're against. And so there are cases where that's, that's actually true. But in the case of cessationism, I think it's actually uh, a practice that, just like you were saying earlier, doctrine has been established as Orthodox Christian doctrine as a reaction against false teaching. Yes. The reason why the church believes anything is because they had to decide after somebody started saying something that wasn't said earlier, like, for instance, the Montanists, who were the very first charismatics, or, for instance, the Arians, who believe that Jesus wasn't God, there had to be other Christians who said, whoa, whoa, what, what's, what are these people teaching in that church over there? Yes. And so um, it's not bad to be against something. It's also true that if you say that you're wrong simply because you're against something and you're ignoring the fact that, for instance, we just watched the entire movie last night, and to say that this is a movie that's really not about anything, it's only against something, would be just really unfair. Yeah, it's just not true. true. Watch yeah, the movie, and you'll be inspired by it. Yep. You'll have a clearer understanding of some things. And thanks for the plug. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's a, really true. It's a very good movie, and it's not the only movie, and it's not the right. end of the discussion. Yeah, you guys no. never promised that you're the the, the this is the be one all truth all. of all time. Right. But man, although people have have asked me, what's your goal? What is your goal in making the movie cessationist? Yeah, and. My answer has always been to demolish the charismatic movement entirely. <laughs> That's my goal. Which actually. is a tall order. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, bits at a time, you know? And it's it's really about 
what what is actually the content of the movie? What are what are the things being taught? So we're kind of the introduction of his video, but this goes back to just we're still when, at the introduction. Yeah, <laughs> when when we did the Ruslan thing, if you're going to really engage in an argument, you should be talking about the opponent's views as they actually and are. Truth. And, and, and the, the and, truth. And the truth. What's really what's really in the movie, opposed to just assuming you know or even what they said in the conference. Yeah. But he doesn't do that. There's no truth spoken here. Well, the conference no. hasn't happened yet, so well, he's just... That's true. Let's keep going. Cessationists are not born, they're made. And they're made by a rigorous process of brainwashing, indoctrination, and a deep cognitive dissonance fetish. But I'm getting... <laughs> fetish. <laughs> you got a mark, fetish. You got to put a mark on there. A fetish. <laughs> a so, deep... Cognitive dissonance fetish. That doesn't even make sense. To, no. to have cognitive dissonance no. couldn't be really a fetish no. because you'd be aware of it yes. in order to have a fetish. Yeah. So he's just throwing insulting words in there to sound smarter or something? Uh, I think what he's saying is... Or you're not aware that you have... Uh, I think what he's saying is that cessation... No, I know... Actually, I know what he's saying because okay. he says it later on here. Okay. He's, he says that cessationists are really just scared. Oh, that that's what he's saying. We're projecting, scared. He's projecting. He's projecting. We're if scared. anyone's done any counseling, you know, when you see this, it's called projecting because oh that's what he believes. Oh just saying. <laughs> you know, yeah, he's that's what he's saying is is that we're scared to embrace the gifts. And that's the reason why yes, we want right. to embrace cognitive dissonance because we don't have any biblical arguments according to Daniel Kalenda. Well, he's not only so, going to say that we're scared, he's going to say we're cowardice. Yep. We're, we're cowards because we look at them and we're like, wow, I wish I could be those, you know, brave charismatics, but yeah. we're, we just don't have the, the great courage yeah, that they right. possess. Right. But it's all about Jesus. Yeah, right. Yeah, to myself. Let's just define cessationism very quickly for those that might not be aware of the debate. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure he's going to give A cessationist accurate... is somebody that believes that, essentially, the gifts of the Spirit, like the ones that are described in the book of 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, are no longer in operation. And let me just read that passage for you for the sake of clarity. Beginning in verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but... In all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So notice that in this passage, Paul gives us nine different things that the Spirit distributes. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and discerning of spirits. And remember that Paul prefaces that list by saying that there are different kinds of gifts that the Spirit gives. So the implication is that those nine things that he lists there are gifts of the Spirit. So people, not, people often refer to this as the nine gifts of the Spirit, although it should be mentioned that this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, and there are many more than nine gifts of the Spirit. Now, the Greek word for gifts here is the word charisma. This is where we get the term charismatic from. Someone sent me a video recently of a guy responding to my podcast about the NAR, and in the podcast, the guy was saying that I didn't know what a charismatic is because no one knows. It doesn't have a definition. Uh... No, that's incorrect, sir. I do know what a charismatic is, and I'll gladly explain it to you. Basically, a charismatic is someone who believes that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. That's why the word charisma, the word for gifts, is in the name, charismatic. And that's essentially all being a charismatic means. There's all kinds of different charismatics. Theologically, there's everything from Catholic charismatics to Calvinist charismatics, and I have friends in both of those camps, so I know for a fact that they exist. So the term charismatic... What was the point of him saying that you could be a Catholic charismatic or a Calvinist charismatic and they and they really do exist? <laughs> I don't know. Because to me, if I was trying to validate my position, I wouldn't say that it's so it's so undefined that you can be a Catholic or a Calvinist and it's mm. still okay. Yeah, That's right. It's kind of like saying the Holy, actually, the Holy Spirit's on a free-for-all. He's just jumping around from place to place. I mean, actually, I, I think that that, 
from his point of view, then, is a tacit embrace of Roman Catholicism. It, because if right. he, he is saying that the same Holy Spirit mm-hmm. who is in him is also in Roman Catholicism. All right. Now, I would say, I would say that there are saved people who are in the Catholic Church despite the Catholic Church's That's right. doctrine. That's right. Absolutely. Despite you could, there are probably saved people in this guy's church mm-hmm. despite right. what this Absolutely. guy says. Mm-hmm. The the Spirit can use the preaching of the Word in. Any context. It's that powerful. That's exactly right. That's right. That, that the word itself, there's a if the Bible is up on the screen, the Holy Spirit can take that word and apply it to yep. the sinner's heart Amen. and save them. And and then what I also believe is that if the Holy Spirit is living inside of a person, they are going to be led out of error and yes. into truth. He is the spirit of truth. Yes. He's not going to leave, the Holy Spirit is not going to leave a person in their error, especially error as terrible as the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification by faith plus works mm-hmm. is. Right. Right? That the Holy Spirit is not going to leave a person in there. So I, I just wonder, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if Daniel Kalinda actually has Roman Catholics at his meetings. I'm not sure if he does or not, well, but a lot were, of these charismatic guys do. Yeah, yeah. at the right. send, uh, it's 2016, I want to say, but I'm not, it's been a while. They actually had Lou Engel kissing the feet of Roman Catholic priests. We want to, Lou, kiss your feet as Catholics and just honor you with this gesture right now. <laughs> that was awkward. Raise up Catholics all over the world. One billion souls of Catholics to come into the kingdom of God. The hour is coming. The chains are broken the loosing of the Lord upon every single Catholic in the world that they would see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They actually had Lou Engel kissing the feet of Roman Catholic priests with this, with Todd White and a whole bunch, Heidi Baker, a bunch of people. Kissing their feet? Literally kissing their feet saying we Show apologize. Show a clip of it, right? This is holy stuff. Signore, io ti ringrazio. Jesus, I thank you. Perché tu stai rompendo lo spirito di divisione della Chiesa. Because you're breaking the spirit of division. Tu prepari un grande risveglio in You're preparing a great revival. Now. Uh, now. <laughs> I might just do here. that. But to me, the unifying factor that that makes somebody a genuine Christian is not their belief in uh, how we're justified, it's right. the fact that we have the ability to speak in tongues. Right. Because that's what he's kind of at least implying here. That right. it, you can be a you can be a charismatic Catholic or a charismatic Calvinist, which mm. is which is another I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Same storms. <laughs> but anyway, um, it, it it points to you can you can be vague on all sorts of really, really important doctrinal things. Yeah. But as long as you're speaking in tongues, going jibby jabby jubby yabba dabba do, then that means you've really got Should've the whole thing. Should have bought a Honda. Yeah, it means very little about what we believe beyond our agreement about what is obvious and frankly what is indisputable: that the gifts, the power, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is just as relevant today as it was when the New Testament was being written. So, the Holy Spirit is just as powerful today as when the New Testament was being written. We would agree with that, but he's saying the reason why we know that's true is because people are doing all these charismatic things. However, if you look at those charismatic things and compare them to, like... The actual events of the New Testament. And even what we see going on in all the other cults and mm-hmm. things that are not Christian, mm-hmm. you know, churches. They can, they can speak in gibberish just as yes. well. They can shake and yes. roll around on the floor just as well. They, you cannot separate them, really. They look... They look the same. Yep. One day I was hiking and I just sat down and I just closed my eyes and I said, what should I do? I don't know what to do. And I heard a very clear voice that said, go to Nashville. I was like, okay, Nashville it is. And I saw people kind of shaking around. And after the program, he came up to me and he said, "Uh, where did you come from? You're a yogi. And I was like, 
like, oh, how does he know I do yoga? The energy was so amazing. People were just getting such amazing manifestations of the divine. And sometimes people say, oh my gosh, I've had this thing forever and I noticed it's healed now. There's got to be a red flag there, folks. Yeah. But they they are, this is the, the Holy Spirit that says, get rid of all your red flags and accept whatever... Daniel is, Kalinda says. Well, and, and, and whatever, <laughs> whatever, I mean, the thought-stopping device, and, yeah. and this is unfortunately really common, obviously not in all charismatic churches. There are some charismatics and charismatic churches that are very cautious and careful, yes. and they try to be biblical. But when you see um, charismatics saying, hey, 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 just let the Holy Spirit do whatever he wants. Don't try to shut it down. This is this is like, okay, you should see at least some of that in the Bible. You should see mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul telling Timothy, now when people start doing a bunch of weird things you've never seen before, don't shut it down because that's how the Holy Spirit works. And don't hold mm -hmm. closely to your doctrine. Yeah, don't <laughs> set the doctrine aside. Let the Holy Spirit just yeah. run rampant and do all the weird stuff that he's really good at doing. Mm -hmm. There should be some passages that say something like that. Anyway, should we keep... Oh, should... yeah. So in that sense... The term charismatic is basically equivalent to the term continuationist, which is a term that we use to refer to the opposite viewpoint of cessationist. Cessationists say that the gifts have ceased. Cease-ationist. Continuationists say that the gifts continue. Continue-ationist. Okay? So now... Another little side issue is that they really should call themselves restorationist because they believe that these gifts mostly stopped for all of human history up until Charles Fox Parham and other cult leaders 120 years ago. Well, at, at least those... Cult leaders 120 years ago believed that. Probably this guy would make the argument that other people were doing it here and yeah, there. Yeah, throughout yeah. throughout history. Let's but keep, but it wasn't it wasn't it normal at all. The terms charismatic and continuationist are not completely synonymous. They're used in somewhat different ways, but that nuance is not important for our discussion today. But here is an interesting side note. Yeah. The word charisma actually has a much broader swath of meaning than most people realize. It goes way beyond simply referring to the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, and it even goes beyond gifts of the Spirit more generally. The root of charisma, charis, actually means grace or favor. And so charisma can refer to any bestowal of God's grace, and not just the stuff that's clearly supernatural either. In the New Testament, charisma refers not only to the spiritual gifts, but also to the gift of eternal life. In Romans eleven twenty nine, it refers to Israel's irrevocable gifts and calling. Yeah, but that's not what we or you really mean when you say that you are a charismatic. Right. Okay. Right. There, when when we're using the term charismatic, we're not talking about the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable to Israel. That's not what it's. He's obfuscating. Mm -hmm. He's taking this word right now, Part of charisma. It. He's taking the word gift, and he's saying this: everyone should be a charismatic because look, the word charisma is used in various different places that everyone should agree upon. Therefore, you should all be charismatics. No, when we're talking about charismatics, specifically we're talking about the embrace of specific gifts, the apostolic sign gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues, healing, and prophecy. That's what all of us mean when we say who a, who a charismatic is. By him using this and saying the gifts, and the word gift is charisma, that that uh, that must mean then that you should embrace everything. He's going to say here in just a minute, you can't be like at a restaurant. Oh, I'd like this one and not this one. This is what he's trying to do. He's huh. making a straw man here. You'll see it here in a second. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 7.7 7 to talk about his gift of celibacy and so on. And so even though cessationists and frankly charismatics as well sometimes tend to think of the gifts of the Spirit as this list of like nine really obviously supernatural and sensational gifts, that's actually a mistake. Paul's theology does not highlight a list of nine gifts that are like the supernatural part of the Christian life. That idea would be totally foreign to Paul. To Paul, everything in the Christian life is intended to be lived in the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, through the grace of God. Christianity, to Paul, is supernatural from beginning to end, and he sees all of it. 
the stuff that we might consider extraordinary, like healings and miracles, as well as the stuff that we would tend to think of as ordinary, like generosity and hospitality. All of it is equally supernatural because all of it is accomplished by and through the same Spirit. That's the thing he mentions over and over again in 1 Corinthians 12. So, look at this. If what he means by that is supernatural, all of it is supernatural, so the gift of hospitality is supernatural. If what he means by that, by supernatural, meaning um, I, I wasn't hospitable before, but then when I became a Christian, I God made me hospitable, and he gave... Let's just say a person who has that gift. He made, he gave me the gift of hospitality. And I, but back when I never invited anyone over to the house, now I want to invite people over to the house. If what he means by that is that that's a supernatural gift, i.e. God gave something to somebody that they didn't naturally have, then I think we can agree that's supernatural. But when we're referring to supernatural gifts, we're not talking about the ordinary manifestation of things like hospitality mm -hmm. or teaching or preaching or evangelizing. What we're talking about specifically are these four things. The preaching, uh, the speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, healing, and prophecy. Those things which he then later even confuses and says that those are supernatural mm -hmm. while the other things are more natural kinds of gifts that God gives to people. This list here. Now, we, we saw that there was one list earlier in 1 Corinthians 12, but there's another list that Paul gives us later on in the same chapter, verse 28. He says, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administering in various kinds of tongues. So look at that. He puts apostles and prophets right next to teachers. He puts gifts of healings and miracles right next to things like helping and administrating. Then again, we have in Ephesians 4.11... Paul puts apostles and prophets right next to pastors and teachers. In Romans 12, 6 through 8, Paul gives another list of gifts of the Spirit, and the, and the list goes like this. Prophecy, then serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, and mercy. You see how they're all together. It's not supernatural things over here and natural things over here. It's all together. It's mixed up. It's combined. Paul doesn't see these distinctions. But here's what the cessationist does. They peruse Paul's lists Here like a menu Insult. at a fancy restaurant and Insult. they say hmm, okay so from first corinthians 12 28 i'll take helping and administering hard pass on apostles and prophets miracles healings and tongues from ephesians 4 11 i'll take pastors and teachers so kenneth copeland's a prophet right that's actually uh his prophet his prophet in the sense yeah. that at least he gets a lot of funding from kenneth copeland yep. <laughs> And Kenneth Copeland was so painfully wrong that the whole world knows it. It's the only charismatics who still want to ignore the fact that he said COVID was over. Uh, and what was Trump it? was going to win. Well, March 31st, uh, 2020 or 21? I think it was 20. Yeah, that's when, that's when COVID was. He said, I speak as a prophet of God. Yeah. yeah. That this day it has ended. That's right. Standing in the office of the prophet of God. Is there really a market for this? I execute judgment on you, COVID-19. Oh, I execute judgment on you, oh. Satan. You destroyer. You killer. You get out. You break your power. You get off this nation. I demand Amen. judgment on you. I demand. Oh. I demand. I demand a vaccination to come immediately. Yes. I call you done. I call you done gone. Why, I only indulge in beluga caviar thrice weekly. It is over. And the United States of America is healed you, and well Thank you. again, Praise. saith the mighty Hallelujah. Spirit. Glory. We are so much better than them in every way, are we not, brethren? At exactly 12 noon on the 29th day of March. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. And Abraham became very rich. Very rich. I was very interested in very rich.
who those deplorable charismatics and their prosperity. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. It's Come on, over. give God glory and praise and honor for this. It's, it's over. over. It's oh, over. it's over. Why does Daniel Kalenda think that's okay? Why does he think that he, on one hand, wants to prop up the idea that we still have prophets today, and he actually is promoting the prophet Kenneth Copeland, and he also wants to ignore the fact that he is, by definition, the falsest prophet you could ever imagine. I mean, did it? He still got it up on his YouTube channel, at least last time I checked. Yeah. They never even took it down. But he's he's making a point here. I think we need to keep listening to, okay. to his point. Okay. Because his point that he's making is that cessationists are picking and choosing, like, if we're at a restaurant. So he, and he, he said keeps... fancy restaurant, and then he says Golden Corral. Sorry, <laughs> right? not a fancy restaurant. But but he's he still needs to make his point, because I want to respond to okay. that. Once it's... But no apostles or prophets, please. And from Romans 12, I'll take serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, and mercy, but no prophecy. I don't think that's how it works. You don't just get to toss the stuff in the Bible that contradicts your theology. Okay, thank you. All right. That is not how it works, actually. And that's also not what we're doing. So what he's saying is you start with your theology first, mm -hmm. and then you twist the Bible in order to come to the conclusions that you had to begin with. So, so 1 Corinthians chapter 12, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit's will to give to whomever he wants whatever gift that he wants. It's not me. I'm not the one who says to the Holy Spirit, oh, we'll take this one and not that one, please. Thank you, Lord God. <laughs> no. What we're saying is this, the Holy Spirit, he's the one who makes the decision to gift to gift to anyone whatever gift he wants to give them. And I'm making the claim that he has not given, because of his will, he has not given the, these miraculous apostolic sign gifts to people after the apostolic age. He has chosen not to give that. It's not that... I'm saying the Holy Spirit shouldn't do that, or I would reject it. Listen, it's very simple. This whole thing is actually very simple. I will become a charismatic if someone can show me one single infallible prophet in the world today. Mm. Just, just show me the infallible prophet that has never been wrong in any of his prophecies, and I will become a charismatic. I will repudiate my movie. I will tell Les to take the movie down. Show me <laughs> one, one actual infallible prophet. Show me one person who did as Acts chapter 5 and the people were laid out on the street and Peter walked by and his shadow fell on the sick people and all of them were healed. When we make the challenge <laughs> that someone should go into a hospital and clear out the cancer ward, which is a thing that these people will uh, uh, like scoff, scoff at. at yeah. Oh, as if that's what the gift of healing... Well, that's what the gift of healing was in Acts chapter 5. That's exactly what happened. So what's the problem then, Daniel Kalenda? Like, uh, is it because they're in the hospital building? How about we take them out of the building, lay them on the street, and then you can pass by right. and have your shadow fall on them and see if any of them are healed. Just show me a person like that. I mean... Because if they just read the Bible in a room all by themselves mm. and they read what Paul did, yeah. they would know that that's what they should be doing. Right. So... Why don't so we just stupid. let him do that? It's yeah. just dumb. Just this, the whole thing is dumb. So anyway, his his point that we are the ones who are choosing. I'll take this gift and not that gift. That's just not true. What what Paul writes is that the same Holy Spirit he apportions to the gifts to whoever he wants. It's his prerogative. It's not ours. Hmm. And the fact that. These things are not happening in the world. The fact that the miraculous sign gifts are no longer happening is the primary evidence. I mean, like I say, I think we can give scriptural evidence as well. But through mere observation, we can see that those things which are happening in Acts are not happening today. Right. They're it, just they're just not. They're not. Not at his meetings in Africa. I saw Reinhard Bonnke with this famous clip of him which is why Michael Brown blocked me on all social media. I saw this famous clip of Reinhard Bonnke saying, 
Be cured of your polio! In the name of Jesus, be healed of polio! And he's like shouting to a hundred thousand African people in the audience that are all like shaking and raising their hands. And what I'm saying is that that didn't happen. No one was cured of their polio. Yeah. It's it, it didn't. Now, can the Holy Spirit cure someone of polio? Yes, he can. But this gift, this apostolic ability to go and heal some people directly on command, to go up to a person who doesn't have a limb and grow the limb back, or heal someone who's on the verge of death by merely passing by them with their shadow, that that's not what's happening today. So it's not, we're not choosing from a menu, they're adding to the menu and saying, you know, these things aren't on the menu anymore and we demand that they are and we're going to pretend like they are. Yeah, That's what's happening, yep. actually. This isn't a buffet at Golden Corral here. This is God's word. Maybe have a little bit of respect. <laughs> Boy. So that's so for, bold. For him to say that we don't have respect for God's word, that's just, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah I, don't, it, I don't have a word for that. I, yeah, I don't even want to go there. Because it wasn't until we left the charismatic right. church that we finally started finding people who actually valued the revered word of God. God's word. Yeah, and it became the focus of a church service. Yes, and I'm not just saying our Lutheran church. No. We were going to that small Bible Reformed church. Yes. It was great. These people loved God's word. Yep. So this idea that they're the only ones who revere God's word because they pretend to be healers and they pretend to gibberish in tongues. I mean, we're not even probably going to have time to get into too much detail, but he's going to talk about. The fact that, or not the fact, he's going to talk about it like they're the ones doing all this stuff when they're not doing the stuff. And the, the biggest one I would point to is they're not speaking in other languages. Yeah, They're speaking in gibberish, yeah. and they're just saying that this is what the Bible is, is saying we should be doing. But the Bible is saying you should be speaking in other languages, and then there should be people interpreting those languages so that there's actually meaning there. This is a, a house of cards when you, when you pull that out. There's just, you're, you're embarrassed by the fact that it's just a bunch of people speaking in gibberish, but... Just to be fair to cessationists, because I don't want to misrepresent... <laughs> oh, oh, she don't reject all wait, of wait, wait. the spirit. He <laughs> just said, to be fair to cessationists, because I don't want to misrepresent them, uh -huh. which is all he's been doing, yes. is misrepresenting the theological position of cessationism. He's misrepresented it from the very beginning. So even this is totally insincere. Isn't he... Del do you think he's really... I mean... I w I'm listening to this and I'm watching him thinking he's delusional. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not, I'm just trying to figure out how can somebody be so that? talking out of both sides of their mouth so, so um, freely. I don't, I don't really know this guy very well. I mean, I watched this video of him. This is the first video oh. I've ever seen of him. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I think, I think in some cases, false teachers and false prophets are self-deceived first. Yes, yeah. Um, they really believe it. And, yeah, they do. And That's then, what this, yeah. And then in, in other cases, they know that what they're doing is fake and they do it anyway. I don't I don't remember if Costi Hen said which one his uncle is. Yeah, I, I seem to recall, if I remember right, him saying that, like, Benny Hinn would laugh about all the money that they got from people that they... I don't know if that's true or not, yeah. but but I think that there's there's people who are who really do believe. Yeah, they're de deluded. Yes, and they they also deceive others. They gladly accept the ones from Paul's list that are not obviously supernatural, like I just mentioned. But this in itself is a little bit sus, as the kids say nowadays, isn't it? I mean, can we just drop the pretense here and address the elephant in the room, please? You okay, so if you were uh, not familiar with this video. What what would the elephant in the room be? If, if you know, my first thought is, well, these guys have the elephant in the room. You got Kenneth Copeland in the room with you, pal. <laughs> yeah. That's the biggest elephant in the entire Christian world. It's the biggest joke on the internet. To, to be a Christian today means you're equated with Kenneth Copeland. Mm. You're equated with televangelists who everybody knows are frauds. To be They're, charismatic, you're talking about. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that it used to be 30, 40 years ago, back when we were kids, to be an, an evangelical meant something right. different 30, right. 40 years ago. Oh, yeah. right. To be an evangelical today means right. you're really closely associated with people like Jim Baker right. or like like uh, Kenneth Copeland or any of the televangelists, the people on TV. 
TBN. So you asked the question, what is it? He's about to say it. He he believes that the reason we're cessationists is because we're scared. Yeah. You cessationists, listen, you guys know that you don't have any biblical justification for cessationism, don't you? <laughs> I, no. So I don't know that. Can I, I want to return to my, my earlier idea that this is what a person does when they're talking to their own audience, they're trying to hold on to their base. Yeah. He knows he's not talking to real cessationists. He knows that. Yeah. But it's it's this is what this is the shtick. Yeah. At the end of the day, this isn't really about theology at all, is it? <laughs> it's obvious what's going on here, guys. Let's just face it. Here it is. You are embarrassed by us. You're I, embarrassed. I by am people embarrassed. That speak in tongues. I'm embarrassed right. for you. Well, That's it. What what he's gonna say here is really interesting because he's he's Going down this path where if he was being more thorough, he would say, you're embarrassed by us because we get so many prophecies wrong over and over right. and over and over. Every time we say something prophetic, we, we, we have to apologize for it about, you know, 20 minutes later because they're all wrong. Everything we yeah. say is wrong. I and mean, we have to apologize for the fact that we have so many scandals within our ranks. Yeah. Yeah. He, but he's not going to say that. What he's going to say is that we're we're looking at all these people doing these amazing spiritual things, and we wish we could be like them, but we just don't have the courage. Prophesy. You don't want to be associated with those crazy charismatics that fall on the ground and do strange things. It's, it's, I don't you want like to be associated looking dignified with them. And intelligent. We <laughs> want to look dignified and intelligent. Just look at me. <laughs> Do I look intelligent? I mean, okay, so there's so much happening here because <laughs> th this is, okay, th one of the common things is to say, well, you know, charismatics, oh, it's all about the heart, it's not about the head. Yeah. This is this is a, an idea that comes from pietism in the 1600s, and it's actually um, a mixture of good and bad, but in general, pietism did a lot of damage, and a lot of those ideas became part of American evangelicalism. And it was... In in a lot of ways, anti-intellectual, mm. but not anti-intellectual in the way that you know we can think above God and we're better than God. But just this basic idea that God has given us rational words. Mm -hmm. He didn't give us mystic mystical experiences so that we would somehow know Him in a Gnostic sense. He gave us actual written down words so that we could look at those words and using our minds we could understand who God is and we could understand the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. We could understand our need for a Savior and how that need has been met in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's all pretty rational. It's still spiritual mm -hmm. and it it's not uh, it's not like it's um, this is this is I think one of the misunderstandings about rational or intellectual thinking. I'm just expressing ideas. Mm -hmm. And he's doing the same thing. He's he's not doing anything mystical at all right now. He's using really, really bad argumentation. But he's still using argumentation. And he's using words and he's using his brain to think of those words. And everybody who's listening to him is listening to those those bad argumentations or those bad arguments. And so we're both doing the same thing, but he's claiming that he's the one who's above this intellectualism mm -hmm. and that all we are is intellectual. Mm -hmm. And rational. That's what this is about. Just admit it. And so this is the reason that you're fine with the nice gifts of the Spirit, like helping and administration and serving and encouraging and giving and mercy and pastors and teachers. Why? Because these aren't embarrassing to you, and they don't carry any kind of burden of proof. They don't expose you to the risk of wait, wait. ridicule or criticism. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we don't want to be ridiculed by pretending to speak another language, languages when it's really just gibberish. Oh, look, man. I think he just put the nail in his own coffin. You don't want to be burdened with the, what did he say? Burden of proof. The burden of proof. Like, bro, I Projection. shouldn't say bro. Projection. I don't think he's, I, I, from this guy, from what he said, I don't know if he's a Christian or not. These but, aren't embarrassing to you, and they don't carry any kind of burden of proof. In other words, we can do nice things, and we don't have to prove that, because right. it's not supernatural. So he's saying the and, burden of proof is on him, Yes, and so conversely then, he can do miracles. Right. So what? Do you not have the burden of proof on you but to, he's, but to he's, actually he, do those this things? Is, this is what you do, though. You claim that you're doing miracles all the time. Right. As if, I don't, I don't have I'm to... I'm assumed. I don't have it's to... It's an it, assumption. Right. I don't have to worry about that burden of proof issue. Because I'm doing, doing it. Because we had a really slick video with a really slick title done by our marketing department that... <laughs> 
<laughs> implies that miracles are happening. Look, Remnant Radio just put out part five yeah. of their takedown of the cessationist movie. And in the beginning of it, they have Sam Storms on their show. It just came out a couple days ago. Uh, a few few days ago. I don't know. Um, and and <laughs> the the guy who usually wears the hat, I don't know what his name is. but With the guy the dark beard. Who, yeah, the guy who usually wears the hat... He said this. He said, we just had a conference the other day, and there were two miracles at the conference, but they're not going to be good enough for the cessationists. These miracles, they're, they're not going to accept these miracles. And then somebody's like, what are the miracles? And then he, he said, find this clip and put it in while I'm saying okay. it. You know? Funny enough, we just did a conference last weekend on the gifts of the Spirit, specifically regarding healing and deliverance. And there were several noteworthy healings that took place, but they still wouldn't match up for our cessationist friends because... We can't do it on demand, as they say, the gift of healing works. So uh, despite the fact that there were a number of flat feet that actually changed shape, that's something you can medically document, and uh, deaf ears that opened up, um, it still wouldn't qualify, though, as the kind of miraculous things that they're looking for. I seriously doubt if the people who no longer have flat feet and can now hear would care whether or not it measured up to the cessationist standards. Or I don't know if flat-footed means you can't walk. Uh, flat-footed, usually, you can walk when you're flat-footed. So so I'm, I don't see I'm what the miracle sure. is. Uh, I don't what? know either. You can, you can get an, in, in, you know, an arch for your sh shoe if you needed that, you would think. Flat-footed, man. I mean, that's right up there with leg lengthening. <laughs> no, what about the show me the toes? Yeah, yeah. The, the woman who pretended that she had her, her toes that were completely gone, regrew. Oh, yeah. And there's no footage of it. <laughs> right. But there is footage of the picture of her toes before she claimed the miracle happened, and they weren't completely missing. And then somebody else was deaf, I guess, and they could hear. No verified. It's not verified. There's no evidence whatsoever that that, that even happened. Look, but even if it did, that still does not prove charismatic theology, because I'm not saying that God can't do miracles right. today. What I'm saying is that there is nobody with the gift yes. of healing who can go and touch someone's flat foot and make it curved then again. I never really noticed how curved my foot is. I'm very now. flat, by the way. Are you? I have very and then there are people feet. with feet that the arch is too high. That's, and that's yours. Well, that's that's one of our daughters yeah. has that. So she had to it's wear like those little inserts. No, it's just oh. it's just anyway. anyway. <laughs> we're, on a, we're on a foot. We're on yeah. a, we're on a... They don't expose you to the risk of ridicule or criticism. They don't expose you to the risk. So, in other words, we only want to believe in the things that we won't be exposed, and then we will be ridiculed by that. Yeah. That's why he's saying. That's why he's saying we reject those things because mm -hmm. we don't. We don't. As cessationists, we don't want the ridicule of the world. We don't want our claims to be tested. We don't want that at all, so we're going to just stay away from anything that looks but if, like it's miraculous. If it was so obvious that this can happen, because he believes the Bible says that it's normal to do miracles. Yeah, normative. Then how does he explain the fact that most of the people, like in the AG movie, uh, a lot of us are former charismatics. Yes. Yeah. They came out of the charismatic movement and embraced a more cessationist position because they knew that none of these things were happening. Yep. And they Why is that? things i've experienced things i'm not going to go into detail but yeah happy to get out of there yeah yep. yeah so okay i mean look guys you say that you believe in the supernatural you say that you believe that god is still moving supernaturally today yeah you just don't want to be accountable for anything <laughs> that demands some kind of evidence for example Man, but that's that's the craziest claim in the whole world. What what he's saying, especially, we don't want to be accountable for something that demands evidence, dude. You don't want to be accountable for something that Rejection. demands evidence. You're the one who's making the extraordinary claims that mm -hmm. all kinds of incredible, miraculous things right. are happening, just as in the days of the apostles, mm -hmm. and yet you have zero Nothing. evidence of them. Right. Zero. None at all. So like. He what like talk about projection? Yes, that is ex exactly what he's doing. He's saying that that's what we're doing. Right? Yeah, and if you think about all the former charismatics 
who had their lives in many cases ruined, marriages yes. lost, yeah. lost yes. homes, businesses, lost children. lost children, everything. Yes. And they finally said, you know, I'm done with this charismatic stuff. It doesn't work. It's right. not happening. Right. It's full of disappointment. And then they go back to a more Bible centric, centric, a more Christ centric, a more gospel centric version of Christianity, which you could also call cessationism, mm -hmm. I suppose. Those are the bad people. According to him, those are the bad people because they experienced all that stuff and they didn't have all the miracles that he, pre frankly, pretends to be having. Right. Why is he making this video? Daniel Kalenda just put up a video full of miracles. That's you wouldn't it. have to That's jump right. through all these intellectual hoops. You wouldn't have to make all these arguments. You know, these what, bad I, you know arguments. what I think? You know what I think? I think that AI is actually going to deceive many people. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting that, thought. That, that, that the, the invention of AI now really could fake seeming miracles yeah signs and wonders hmm. that antichrist yes. is going to perform yes. i mean if you believe in a literal antichrist i, I do um that 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 this the scripture is talking about in the last days there will be many false prophets doing evil kinds of works evil kinds of miracles i just wonder if the if the sort of video technology that's available now is starting to become available now okay so if you all of a sudden start seeing what seems to be real miracles yeah after by, the invention of ai guy. yeah then what? You have to ask the question, why are we seeing these miracles now after the invention of AI? How That's come right. we haven't seen these miracles before the invention of AI? Yeah, honestly. Example, the cessationist author Richard Gaffin says that he believes salvation is supernatural. Of course it is. No work of the Spirit, he says, is more radical, more impressive, more miraculous, and more thoroughly supernatural than what he does now, today, with people who are nothing less than dead in trespasses and sins. Beyond any human capacity, rational, reflective, intuitive, mystical, or otherwise, the Spirit makes them alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, I appreciate that, and I think that Gaffin is right about salvation being supernatural and miraculous. But here's my question. But. Why is he okay with salvation being supernatural, even the most supernatural thing of all, but not okay with lesser supernatural things like prophecy and tongues? I'll tell you why. Doesn't that... No, that's not even a good question. No. It's not a good question at all. No, it's it's like a gotcha. It's horrible. Why know. is he okay with the greatest right. supernatural thing and not okay with lesser supernatural things? I'll tell you the reason why. The reason why is because those lesser things, which indeed are lesser, those miraculous abilities of the apostles were given to the apostles in order for the greater supernatural thing yes. to be confirmed, the conversion of souls. That's right. right? So that's actually the purpose for which they were given but the reason why is because salvations salvation is still happening today and those other miraculous abilities aren't <laughs> that's the reason why like that's actually the reason why we yeah. reject them yeah we re we reject the these manifestations fake manifestations right. by this guy and the people that he's related to and associated with because it's not real because they have no burden of proof at all right. they have no evidence whatsoever right. for any of them that's it. That's have, the have, reason why. They have stories. That's it. It's all anecdotal stories mm -hmm. with zero, zero evidence at all. I mean, Paul even says, do I not have the Holy Spirit? Right? This this is something that I think um, uh, real Christians need to grasp and, and wrestle with. That true, if he's saying, I'm his brother... That I, I'm a Christian. I'm, I have the Holy Spirit indwelling me, who is the spirit of truth, who leads us into truth, right? Then why wouldn't that same Holy Spirit who leads us into truth be performing miraculous deeds in churches that are cessationist, with people who really do believe the Bible, right? Who believe that, that these things aren't happening now then wouldn't the evidence be that it started happening in those places? How come it's confined just to, uh, you know, the outreach of Daniel Kalenda or the the church of, of Kenneth Copeland? Like, that's where the miracles are confined to? God giving these stupendous ability to the people with the absolute worst theology on earth? Well, and it's like the Holy so Spirit. so crazy. The Holy Spirit's looking for the people who are the most gullible, 
and who value the Bible the least in order to show up there. But when people really value the Bible, the Holy Spirit's like, ah, I can't go there because I, mean, I can't do all the weird stuff I want to do. Those people are too busy reading their Bibles and studying their Bibles. I mean, for, for that matter, I, I just, I would love to know if John Piper or Sam Storms or Wayne Grudem uh, or Don Carson, um, I mean, honestly, if they have ever seen somebody with a withered hand, their hand grows back uh, in their church. I want to know if they've ever seen anything like that in the context of like a far more sound, biblically based church. Yeah. Because I don't think that the answer to that is yes. Uh, even Sam Storms, when when they said like, "Oh, the foot was healed and he could walk," and then, but it's not going to be good enough for the cessationist. And then Sam Storm said in that Remnant Radio interview, he, he said, "I don't, I don't think the person who can walk now cares what the cessationist think." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's other explanations for like why their feet might not hurt. Like one might be adrenaline from being in a, yes. a massive audience and thinking that something has changed. One might be a release of dopamine mm -hmm. in the brain, which takes away that. Like, wow, right. amazing! I'm um, that could be a potential explanation. That's for often that. the case. It's yes. it's not that hard to figure this stuff out. Are we still only in the first five minutes? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh boy. You know, maybe we should Are break we? this up. Let's do it in two. I don't care. Yeah. Because we've been we've been here for a while now, like an hour and a half, I think, or more. Yeah, because we're we're about halfway through. But you can, but I mean, you can break it up in editing, right? But I'd rather do it where we stop, okay, and start again, okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. We're talking about the the video that we're in the middle of right now. Just give us a <laughs> so second. So, in other words, he doesn't come back another day. No, do it, oh. do it. We'll turn off. You know, take a potty break. I would and come have back to. Down. I would have to wear the break. same thing. That's fine. Okay, thanks for watching everybody. We're going to come right back and we're going to finish this with a second video that'll be completely separate and even better than this one. See wait, ya. I don't know about wait, that. Wait, wait. You didn't say hello from <gasps> College Town. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, come on. <laughs> hello from College Town. <laughs> you you are so familiar with our show. <laughs> I am. Hey, Shout he out. was the one that remembered. Shout yeah. out to all of our guests is all over the world. Hey, we're having a shout out at the end because I forgot to do the shout out at the beginning and the guy that doesn't even know what's called the shout out told me all about the <laughs> shout out from College Town. <laughs> yes, so thank you. Thanks right. for being hey, with us. We're just mixing things up. Can you here. make the dogs howl now? No, it no, hurts my ears. There. Okay, good. This one screams and this one just starts... Choking. It is actually really funny. <laughs> no. It is really, really cute. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll be right back and we'll do another video. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Basta!